Okay, so for this breakout, if you guys would like to um, put video on, um, we can definitely do that. Uh, it's kind of weird to just see names up there. And I really want to make um, this breakout session very interactive. Um, I want questions. I want to be able to go back and forth. Um, I know we're an hour in, so the more interactive will keep everyone awake. So um, we are talking about finding your team identity from my coaching perspective and also kind of from my athlete's perspective. And to start off, um, from my athlete's perspective, um, I really always appreciated when coaches um, identify different types of leaders on a team, right? You have your, your vocal leaders, you have your quiet leaders, you have your leaders that are really great at connecting the team outside of the water. So I really appreciated in, um, I think it was 2004, that, that training quad, Guy Baker early on established uh, a mafia, <laughs> and the mafia <laughs> consisted of three different players on the team that represented three different um, just groups on the team. And we would have these monthly, weekly meetings where we just touched base about anything that was... Um, out there if, if athletes are feeling really tired, if athletes are not feeling connected, if athletes were feeling uh, or losing confidence or, or anything, right? Because as coaches, we only see um, what's going on in the water. And sometimes we don't see these other dynamics that are happening in the locker room or away from the pool. And especially for us in full-time training, we were spending a lot of time together. So that is something that I remember and really appreciated it as an athlete. And now as a coach, I try to incorporate that in some, in some way. Um, and something that I learned from, from Adam in my fourth quad was this, also this, idea of that shared leadership. And that's kind of what Maggie referenced um, earlier on. And with Guy, he had this mafia and we all talked, but Adam took it to another level and really established a shared leadership in the pool. And I think that was one of the reasons why we were so successful in London. Um, there was this shared leadership amongst myself, you know, second time around Olympic captain and Maggie Steffens, who was a youngster on the team, but also like Betsy Armstrong and Heather Petrie. So there really was um, a lot of different leaders on the team. And I think Adam did a great job of kind of identifying the roles for all the players on the team and giving them a leadership role, whether it was a small role, big role, it didn't matter. Everyone had um, this buy-in because they were a leader on the team. So I really, really appreciated that. And I think for London, that was something that kind of got us over um, the hurdle. And then as a coach now, I've coached really beginner kids, kids that um, have no aquatic background. And I also coach uh, a high school team. And different things that I've, that I've learned is really setting realistic expectations um especially for my high school team at the beginning of every season like I'm very competitive and something I had to learn early on making the switch from athlete to coach it's like it it doesn't really matter what I want right it matters what my team can produce um the the want and the will that, that they want so it's always having these preseason meetings and asking the girls you tell me what you want your goal to be for me, I want us to win CCS. I want us to win the open division. I want us to do all these things. But if you guys don't want that, I'm okay with that. Um, so you just have to tell me right away. So I think that's really important, just having realistic goals and having this conversation with, with your athletes. I mean, something that I always stress to my athletes is one of my goals is just to make you better throughout the season. So I want to be playing our best water pool at the end of the season. And if that means that we're in the CCS final, because that was one of our goals and it's worked out, then, then that's great. If it means that we lost first round, but we got better every game throughout the season, then it's a successful season for me. So really not trying to project onto my players. And that was, it took me a couple of years because like I said, I'm very competitive and everyone always has this expectation of what you can do. So that's something that I really like to stress. And then um, also just like with beginner club teams and kids, I know that everyone, well, 
for my team, it was like, let's qualify for JOs. And I had this like really beginner team and qualifying for JOs in Northern California is extremely tough because there are so many teams trying to qualify. So then just explaining to them, you know, like, what do we want? Do we want to have fun? What are we doing? Do we want to qualify? How many games? And just really telling them that for me, it's the love of the game that keeps me coaching and, and involved and just trying to get or trying to connect with my players so that we all have the shared mission. So I think these are little bits um, that I kind of live by to try and find an identity of a team. Um, but now I would love to just answer some questions and kind of um, go back and forth with you all. Let's see here. Oh, wait, let me see. Has anybody posted any questions? Do you guys have any questions? I don't know if we have, do we have the capability of just going, unmuting yourself to ask a question? Yes? Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> if anybody, if any of you have questions, feel free to maybe like raise your hand or unmute yourself and we can kind of go back and forth. Go in the orange, I can't see your name, but go, oh, Joshua, go for it. Oh. I get it. Oh, maybe you don't. Or, but you did. I can't hear you, Joshua. Jose, maybe you should like, if you're using AirPods, definitely check and double check because when I've done Zoom meetings with friends on AirPods, they've had to like restart. So okay. that might be yeah. it. Yeah, no, my, my headphone microphone doesn't work anymore. I, thank you. I apologize. Um, no so I, you mentioned kind of setting team goals and expectations. So I, I do 12 years with our club. Um, so, you know, similar idea. Some of the kids are a little bit more advanced, but for the most part, this is their first, you know, time interacting with the sport. So there's a lot of me kind of nudging them towards having these team goals, right? Our goal, we're in San Diego. It's probably a bit easier to qualify for JOs, but it's still like you gotta, you got to win games at the balls. Um, that's kind of what we talk about. That's kind of one of our broad goals. But how do you, you know, kids are coming in without any knowledge of what is possible. So how do you help them find those goals when they have never heard of change? You know, their parents don't want to go on a four-day weekday vacation. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you know, something that I do is like I've opted out the last couple of years not to do JOs. And that's okay. And I know USA Waterfall might be like, Brenda, don't send that message. But really for me, it's what do we want to get out of it? Do we rather do these other smaller tournaments that are local? Like, yes, water polo is expensive and a water polo, like for me, that's always something that I have in mind because I work with, with a group that is um, under-resourced. So to me, it's always making the most of the opportunities, but it's also talking to parents often, especially at that young age, because the parents are the ones that are making all these decisions. Um, it usually doesn't matter if your kid wants to do JOs, if the parent already has their um, week planned in the summer, right? So, you know, something that we could all do better for the beginner age group is, you know, someone signs up, you right away tell them, hey, this is JO week. This is really important in our sport. Most kids that talk about this all year long, um, this is something we aim to do, but we need everyone to buy in. And whether it's uh, some sort of contract that they sign, right? And say like, hey, if we qualify, we're gonna commit to it because we do play a team sport. And I've been in situations where we qualify, right? And then a parent will tell me like, oh, you know, I'm, I can't make it. So it, it's really unfortunate for the rest of the team. So I've kind of have come around to where a kid signs up, I tell them right away, or the family right away, like, hey, this is something that we're always interested in. We may not always go, but can you please block off these dates? And one thing that I will give USA Water Polo kudos for is they've realized that they have to set those dates far in advance. So I think the next couple of years, those dates are set. The only thing that now kind of gets in our way is the qualifying dates, right? Sometimes they vary within zones. And unfortunately, we um, are a sport where there isn't enough pools, <laughs> as, as much as there are enough pools, there aren't right, because then it comes to booking them and, and the summer really is short and trying to get everything in. So um, I know that one of my wishes is that we had those dates already, but it's something that, that I know the zones are working on hard and the earlier we get those things out. That's one thing that I think is hindering our sport, which we're constantly trying 
to to improve and I constantly give that feedback to the higher ups at USA Water Polo, but there's just some things that are beyond our control still. Any other questions? Hi. Um, yes. Go for it. Um, so um, I'm a coach in South Africa, so we don't, there's not many coaches. So you find yourself coaching multiple teams. So I'll coach at two different schools, I coach boys and girls, and then I coach at national level. And then sometimes you find that your coaching identity is then kind of what is then um, hard to figure out because in one area you can be really tough on the team then the other you have to be actually more gentle you're working on different things and then you just feel like the pressure is really on you to almost make all the teams that you're part of in your coaching to be fantastic but obviously you can't set the same goal for all, all your teams so as a coach how do you kind of like um come into yourself and you speak to yourself and motivate yourself to not be as hard <laughs> and competitive, um, just setting that personal expectation for yourself as a coach. I'm really like kind of struggling with that because also being a female in the sport in South Africa is kind of like, it's not popular, obviously. So yeah, just I would say right. not even in the US. <laughs> Sometimes, I, I mean, I wish there was more but, female coaches, but um, I would say that I wouldn't, advice to like not have those thoughts of you trying to like be the best for all different levels and striving to be your best but do cut yourself a little slack i know that i personally um have a mentor like my college coach i still talk to very often and i touch base with him about different tactical things and he's always like Brenda, did you really think your team was going to win that tournament? And I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't i have thought that? You know, i thought if we would have done a b or c like we could have done it. He's like that other team was really good. I mean, you guys played well, but let's be realistic. So I think having a mentor, if that's possible, to kind of someone from the outside that is watching you um, just kind of check in with. I mean, that always helps me or I'm, I'm really down about a, a tough loss that we've had. I'll get a text from JT and he's like, great job. You know, that six on five at the end to put you within one was, you know, great. You execute, they executed it great. And I'm like, oh, we did do a good job. So like he helps me sometimes put it in perspective because I do, um, yeah, self-criticize myself a lot or even with my younger kids where I feel like, oh my goodness, we won one game at JOs. He's like, Brenda, like remember two years ago, these kids couldn't swim. Yeah. Like you're doing, you're doing okay. So I think really for us coaches, it's really important to have other mentors or to have other coaches that we can check in with, that we trust. Um, to kind of keep us sane in this process as we're trying to manage so many different teams, because I'm sure most coaches are in the same boat. You're either coaching a high school team and a club team and your club team doesn't have enough coaches. So really checking in or getting a support system with other coaches. And it could be even be coaches from other sports. Um, I have yeah. friends that are from other sports from college that coach or, or are still connected in sports. So like I sometimes reach out to them and kind of just ask them, for like pointers so yeah just see if there's somebody else that you can kind of bounce ideas around yeah perfect thank you so much mm -hmm. any other are we being shy should i cold call people and just see if there's anything on your mind you want to talk about um i guess oh, kind of going off of that yeah hi uh, mm -hmm. i guess kind of going off of that too um how it like what sort of advice like would you give when it comes to trying to like seek out a mentor so like for me like i've been coaching club for a really long time and it's actually my first year that i'm coaching uh at the collegiate level which is like super awesome and have the opportunity to uh, work under some other really experienced coaches and, and being able to just kind of really pull in of just a wide variety of just new knowledge be able to absorb everything like a sponge but at the same time, like I also want to contribute in my own right. And even though it's like a program that's definitely made a name for itself, I want to be in a position of what can I do? And so I, I guess my question kind of is like, how, um, like, how can you like, or what experiences have you been able to sort of pull from to be able to create that identity for yourself to like set yourself apart from like, just being like a part of the system and rather being like, okay, like, oh, like, it's less like, yeah, like, she's really great with like, 
kind of keeping things as they were, but like, oh, like that's actually a really good idea. Or like, oh, she established this new thing that we now implement in our program. Well, one thing I would suggest is um, any professional development that you could do. I know that on the mm -hmm. women's side specifically, my other college coach, Susan Ortwine, has started Wopac, which it's an acronym for women in coaching. And they yeah. have like this, I don't know if you've have attended one of their conferences, but they have this yearly conference where they get together and there's um, PowerPoints about different aspects of the game. Um, if you want to establish yourself, a way you could do that is you can email her and be like, hey, I would love to talk about water polo in, in my city, in my state, and what we're doing. I think that it can offer insight to other states because these are the obstacles that we're getting through or having to go through. Um, that's, and, that in, and in that space, it'll be easier to kind of find a mentor or someone that you connect with because there are women referees, women coaches from all over the U.S. and some international that just come in and people want to connect. People want to help each other out. And the beauty of our sport, the I guess the beauty and then not the beauty, right? Like we're still such a small sport that we're like one phone call, one email away from most people. Um, I love that, but that's also like, I want us to not be that way in the future, but we're still in that space. So um, if there's anybody that you would love to chat, like, let me know and I can see if there's any way that I could kind of connect you. But I think the more we share and collaborate, I mean, there's no, sec no secrets, right? Like we all kind of run similar plays. It's just a matter of... Um, yeah, well, what kids we have and how long we've been playing and the exposure that we've had. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, sorry. Hi, Brenda. Um, just a, I think maybe a more simple question. Um, just in terms of um, the length of sessions, do you have any guidelines that you find sort of works well, um, but then also covering different age groups? So, you know, if we have to start from eight, nine-year-olds um, up until top players. Um, I'm sure like, I'd also be interested to hear how you trained in the national setup, how many hours, that type of thing. So uh, when I do beginner 10 and unders, people that are not, are not aquatic athletes, I usually do 45 minutes. And it's really like our sport is so hard. So if you've never had like a swimming background and you're in the water trying to tread like – going more than 45 minutes is really hard for these kids. And then it just kind of depends. If you're in a shallow shallow space, then you might be able to do an hour. But if you're kind of in a, in a space where you don't have the shallow water, then I really keep the 45 minutes. I find it hard for most levels to do more than two hours. I think at the national level, we do, or the Olympic level, um, the most is three hours, but even with that three hour session, we have like dry land warm up at the beginning and a slight small cool down at the end. So I don't think I'd recommend anything longer than that. Um, in high school, I kind of stick to two hours. Um, and these are, I would say, solid, solid group of, of kids that I coach. Um, and I do more swimming, like, at least 30 minutes of conditioning and that's because I have like a smaller team and we can't always go six on six where we could get our water polo conditioning and I need them to be very fit throughout the season because they all play lots of minutes so it just kind of depends um what your roster looks like um at the olympic level we would go 10 practices a week and it would it used to be 11 and we would go double days and then Saturday one morning practice where we would scrimmage but um, at some point Guy Baker got um, <laughs> really smart and figured out that Saturday mornings we just were done like we'd have a scrimmage and first quarter in he'd make us all start over because we were playing really really bad so Saturday mornings just ended up being detrimental to everybody so he was like oh maybe that's not the best idea so then it turned into a model where it went to Monday Tuesday Thursday Friday doubles and Friday I mean Wednesdays was just one middle of the day session where we were able to sleep in and it just kind of broke down the week and then when Adam came in he kept that model but also added a Saturday morning conditioning he's like you guys don't need two days off so <laughs> um, at least it wasn't scrimmaging where we had to think 
right? It was just more like, come here, we're going to condition, you're on autopilot, just get through it. Um, so yeah, and, and all that is in, in the water. It's, it's running, it's lifting, it's video sessions. So depending on what part of the year we're in or what um, part of the quad we're in, it will vary how much of that is water time. Did that answer all your questions? I know you had a couple subsets in there. Uh, no, sorry, that's, that's great. Um, okay. If everyone doesn't mind, um, would you mind just also sort of, I know it might depend on where in the season you are, but just roughly, how, how, how would you break down, let's say a two hour session in terms of conditioning and would that conditioning involve more ball or does that also depend on time of the year and that type of thing? Um, yeah, so at the beginning of the season, it's like, the 30 minutes, regardless of I'm going to swim you and, and do these sets. And some of those will be head up freestyle. Some of those will be um, sprinting and jumping and, and doing these things. Um, I would say at the end of practice, it's always probably 30 minutes of controlled scrimmage. Um, I don't often just let them scrimmage. Um, it's always, let's start in this front court. We're in a drop from two, three. Um, we're going to counter out of it and then um, and see kind of how it goes. I like to stop it midway and kind of just if I see something I don't like or something that doesn't fit in our system, like a decision, I'll stop it and be like, OK, this is what you decided to do. But let's look at it this way. And now let's restart from here. So it'll be about 30 minutes of structured um, game situations, I guess, or game like um there's i don't do as much shooting as i would i would like um try and do more of that at the beginning of the season or preseason just kind of looking at their shot and giving them pointers which i go back and forth because at the end if you can't put the ball away then um it's not going <laughs> to it's not going to go very well but we're also a team sport um so I really do need them on the same page when we're working on defenses or on offense, like where do we need the ball? Um, what are we running? So that's a dilemma that I always come across, like how much of individualized shooting do I give them? Um, and sometimes I'll offer Saturday practices and that's all we do is shooting. And I know that that's one of the reasons why I, I work with a couple kids individually and and everyone's always like, oh my God, thank you so much. It's like, it's not that I'm doing that much. I'm just giving you the shooting time you don't usually get at practices because your coaches can't afford to give everyone an hour of shooting every week because then you don't come together to get your game plan together. So it's the, I'm giving kids the reps when I work with them and kind of tweaking things here and there. But that's kind of, I think, the dilemma for our sport, or right? Team sports. It's like, how do you do individual skills, but also still do the tactical things that you need to do to, to be successful. Mark, did you have? Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, when it goes to identity, uh, this is my third year as a head coach. Um, I don't know how you can uh, help me out here, but I'm still compared to the coaches that were there before me mm. with like 20 years of experience. And it's like, well, he didn't do it like that. He didn't do it like this. Um, so he's still one of my mentors that, you know, he basically tried me out as his JV volunteer coach for a year and then gave me the job. But it's like, how do you kind of mold your identity on some good things? You know, like I created the bench mafia, you know, it's the kids that you're going to play against the bad teams that were killing and, you know, they're actually my game captains. You know, mm -hmm. they do the coin toss and everything beforehand. Um, but they're the guys that get riled up. You know, they pump everybody up during the game um, when they get in. You know, so that's kind of one of my things. But how do you kind of deal with the parents that kind of compare you to other coaches when it's like, hold on, I'm not them, and take a step back <laughs> yeah. and not get frustrated? Yeah, um, I find myself kind of just going – back to hey the game has evolved it continues to evolve um yes meant or jt taught me all these fundamentals and now he's evolved as a coach and i'm evolving as a coach to adjust to the way the new game is being called um yeah just kind of reminding the parents like hey those are all great ideas i've considered them 
but also now we need to see a new direction where we all need to go. And I think the parents, they're always background noise, right? So as long as you can get the buy-in from your players and you, you tell them like, this has all worked, but let's try something new, right? And that's something where even for me, like on the Olympic team, right? Guy and Adam, both great coaches, Adam coached under Guy, right? So a lot of similar um, philosophies, they have different approaches. And then in the end, for whatever reason, like it worked in London and we won gold and we didn't win gold in any other Olympics. But to me, it's just, I think about like, they both have evolved, right? Like it couldn't just be like Adam learned under Guy and he's gonna keep all these same um, tactics, te like technical skills, philosophies. It's like he had to evolve in some way and that helped the team evolve. So I think just reminding everyone that um, the game isn't um, stagnant, right? There's new things popping up all the time so that you need to try and experiment with with new approaches, especially like, you know, back in the day, four meter penalty, now it's a five meter penalty. There, there are different things that you have to change in order to continue to be successful. But I mean, the parents are their parents. Like, you know, we all know, right? Like <laughs> there's only so much you can do there to make them happy. Any other questions? Um, I just have one question. Um, so how do you keep your, the, your team motivated in the off season. So lots of our players will play other sports. Mm. They play rugby, they play netball and hockey and we'll have winter training, but it's going to be like once a week almost, right? So now how do you keep them still in that water polo mindset and still kind of like excited about the game and thinking about that and still um, conditioning themselves for water polo in the off season, even though another sport is kind of taking their attention at that time? I think in the U.S. we're fortunate that at a certain age, everyone kind of just does water polo year-round. Um, but I will say that at young, younger ages, I'm always one saying they should do other sports. Like specialization at an early age, right? You should be playing other sports because up until your freshman year of high school, like, Play other sports if you can I mean I know some coaches are like no you need to specialize from age 12 but it's like no like the skills you learn on a basketball court will help you in the water so um, something that I like to suggest is video and now with technology you can go you find all the games so I know that from a young age I was able to take in a lot of water polo knowledge because I was a 10 year old sitting on the side watching the 16 under players scrimmage. Um, I was probably doing a rebound board and watching. So the more water pool you can watch, the better, especially if you don't have access to a pool. Um, but also there are some dry land things you can do. And I think Maggie and Tony have done a great job of putting up all these um, videos of things that you can do on land that are specific for water pool because we, our egg beater is so foreign to anything on land, right? So they're coming up with different um, drills on land to kind of help you stay um, with the water polo on the mind. So I would just suggest that maybe you check out their, um, their workout sessions and maybe tell your kids like, hey, I know you're doing other sports, but you know, maybe do some abs while you're catching the ball just so that they're not losing the touch of the ball. Right, that's always something like when I'm away from the water for two weeks, it's like, okay, where's the touch of the ball? Do I feel it? Like, am I catching? So um, hopefully that helps. Okay, I think we might have time for one more question. Is there anybody that hasn't asked a question that wants to ask one? If not, I'll hand it over to Josh over here. Okay, go for it, Joshua. So you touched on it. Uh, uh, did he freeze? No. no. Hello. Hi. Did you have a question? It's not working. It's not working. No, I. Oh, the specialization thing. Just every single study ever ever done says kids shouldn't specialize. Our sport is now going pretty standard: five, four practices a week, games every weekend. How how do you keep kids mentally healthy while keeping up with the Joneses? Well, 
I, I mean, that it is hard, right? It is hard. I just, I was lucky that I had a club that did swimming and water polo combined and I 